Hey everybody, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today's episode is a different format. The Modern Customer Podcast heads to Salt Lake City, Utah. In Salt Lake, I caught up with my friend Dion Nicholas at the Qualtrics X4 Annual Summit. And Dion and I are doing a rapid fire round all about AI. Dion is often on TV talking about new AI trends or AI news. He is the founder, president, and executive chairman of Forethought, which is an advanced agentic AI for customer experience software provider. Forethought powers support for leading customer-centric organizations like Upwork, Grammarly, Airtable, and many more. It's raised $90 million in venture capital, was named to CNBC's 25 top startups for enterprise, Forbes AI 50, and recognized by G2 as best ROI and best customer service. Dion and I do rapid fire AI. I've never done this before, so we had a lot of fun and hopefully you'll learn something. Please enjoy Dion Nicholas. Dion, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. We're here at Salt Lake City X4 Qualtrics annual event. How's it going for you so far? It's going well, a lot of fun. Um, a lot of uh, talk about AI and the future of customer experience. So it's an exciting place to be. Yeah, you were just in the executive uh, forum yep. and they were asking you about AI and agentic AI. What kinds of questions were they asking you over there? Well, this was a fun, fun panel. So there were a couple of us. So the instruction was, um, should we be accelerating agentic AI in our organizations or should we be slowing down? Um, and there were a couple on the panel, myself included, who were all for accelerating agentic AI. And uh, there were a couple who were talking about the very real risks, I will, I will uh, admit. Um, and it, it ended up being a really lively conversation. All right, so I have some rapid fire questions for you today. I have about 20 I wanna get through. Oh, okay. We weren't gonna do any of this, but I saw Dion and I grabbed him and I thought he has to be on the Modern Customer Podcast to answer our AI questions because you know, it's not an easy topic. There's a lot Very out true. there. So it's hard to distill the noise. So we're gonna get right to the heart of it. Are you ready? I'm so ready. And okay. Thanks for having me back on the Modern Customer Podcast. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so first question. What's the biggest misconception about AI and customer experience? Ooh, I think the biggest misconception is that you can do everything you want with a, an FAQ-based chatbot. LLMs, GPT, and the whole Gen AI movement have enabled better customer experiences, but still the majority of customer service questions require some kind of action, follow-up, business policy, and the majority of AI chatbots today don't actually do that, and I think that's a, a little misconception. Why don't they do that? Um, I think information only is the easiest, lowest common denominator question for LLMs, for generative AI. And so you're seeing a ton of talent and a ton of people just tracing after that. Um, but from our data, and we process over a billion interactions per month now at Forethought, which is super exciting, um, it turns out only about 23% of customer service inquiries are information only. The remaining 77% all require some form of action, account lookups, you know, password, like all this, all these things. And it's just a much harder problem. That's where you actually need AI that can reason, can take action, can ask follow-up questions. And uh, so I think a lot of people are just going after the lowest common denominator and not really willing to put in the work to like, you know, solve the, the remaining problems. Is it a mix of work and money, a lot more money? So to invest, yes, right? To build the technology, yes. But luckily there are vendors, ourselves included, who have put in a lot of that um, work. And we, we've been around since before the GPT days building out a lot of this technology. And so as Gen AI has become this wave, we've been able to both ride that, but also contribute back. And now the way I see it, I think Gen AI is even out of date. It's really agentic AI, this ability to do that, like actions, reasoning, and so on, that I think are, are really separating kind of your you know, net new vendors who are just throwing AI on stuff for the first time and, and those who are really solving problems for organizations at scale. All right, well, I realize we called this rapid fire, but I'm giving you questions that are not rapid. All right, I'll go faster. Difficult. No, you don't. <laughs> um, how can companies use AI to personalize experiences without being creepy? Ooh, I think a lot of that boils down to data, right? Like being able to actually tap into the real conversations you've been having, whether it's with that particular customer or beyond, that actually forms a training set for, for AI. It allows you to know what is the, the tone of my brand? What do my customers actually like? What do they not like? What are the key common 
uh, problems that are going on, and, and so on. And so I think if you can actually leverage your data and use AI that is built on your data, not just from like decision trees or something like that, then you're actually going to be able to personalize a lot more in a way that feels natural. Are there any subtleties of managing the data in a way that doesn't upset customers? Yeah, I mean, for example, security is a big one, right? Like, um, then the question starts to arise, how are you using my data? How do you even know this about me, right? Like, you never want to be in that situation um, where um, customers don't trust how you're using their data. So there's a lot of things you got to do to be transparent up front. For example, just telling them they're using an AI will, will be, you know, light years of difference in terms of trust. Um, and I think there are a ton of things like that. Data redaction, being able to train models on anonymized data so that you're not actually using any other PII. I think all that can be um, really important. For our audience, what is PII? Personally identifiable information. So this is like your name, your email. Like if you're talking to a bank, then it's information about your finances. Like all this stuff is, is personal to you. But it turns out like if you think about, let's say, a simple customer service inquiry or question, if somebody's like, hey, my name is John. I'm having this and this problem. The model doesn't need to know John when it's training on data, right? It could be redacted, and we actually do this. We have a, any data that hits our servers before touching any LLMs or anything like that gets auto-redacted for PII. Um, and so in our system, it would be stored as, hey, my name is name underscore underscore one or something random like that, right? And so that actually reduces any um, data risk, like in, you know, in the case of things like breaches. And it also means that the model, the AI, is not training on anything that's personal to you, but it's actually training on language, what kinds of questions are being asked, and things like that, so that it can get really smart without having to expose itself to personally identifiable information. OK, smart. What's an overlooked AI tool that businesses should start using today? Ooh. I think, I mean, going back to this idea of data, using your AI to help you figure out your strategy is really important. We're seeing a lot of use cases around AI agents uh, that can act as chatbots, responding directly to your customers. I think that's the most common and, quite frankly, the highest ROI use case, and, and, and if done well. And then the second use case we're seeing is AI for in kind of an agent assist or co-pilot mode, make your agents, um, help your agents operate a lot faster. But one of the things that we do at Forethought and the things we're, we're, we encourage our customers to do is to now use AI as almost a supervisor layer. Right? We have a product we call Discover that's reading through support inquiries, both things that the AI is handling, but also what the humans are handling. And it's able to say, hey, you have a gap here, like a skills gap. There's a lot of agents uh, who aren't able to handle questions about password reset because your CSAT is lower, or your AI agent doesn't know how to handle questions about refunds. And hey, maybe there's missing knowledge articles or missing data here. Um, and heck, let's use Gen AI to suggest or generate that article. Right. So that ability to use AI to create this feedback loop, both for your customers, your agents, but also support and customer experience leaders in general can actually be an unlock. What are some of the things that practitioners don't understand about agentic AI? Ooh, I mean, I think like what is agentic AI? Because this, this name is thrown around everywhere, right? And what, what we're seeing is the rise of a lot of vendors um, just using the phrase AI agent. And it's almost starting to become a buzzword. And they're using it to mean anything. Any AI that operates on behalf of your company is technically an AI agent. But just because something's called an agent doesn't make it agentic. Um, again, the majority of AI agents out there are FAQ only. So I think there are a few criteria you always need to ask your vendor to understand whether it's truly agentic. And the first is, can it do action or just information? When you know, when asked to reset your password, is it going to just tell you the five steps to resetting your password, or is it going to verify it's you and uh, you know actually reset your password in the system, right? Like so, end-to-end -end action versus information. The second is, can it reason through business policies, right? So again, going back to like a refund use case, your AI, if it's truly agentic, should be able to know. Okay, we have a 30-day money-back guarantee. I'm going to look up your order, see if it's actually within the window, um, and sometimes can it um, do uh, make exceptions, right? You might even encode into your agentic AI, hey, if they're extremely angry, you better escalate or maybe offer like a one-time money back guarantee or something like that, right? So the ability to reason through complex business policy is number two. Um, and then the third, which is really critical, is does it have access to integrations? 
And I think that's something that's really overlooked. But in order for any agentic AI to actually operate autonomously, it should have access to hitting APIs or databases or things like that, again, in a safe and secure way. But um, I would argue between those three things, the majority of AI agents out there probably are missing, if not two, all three of those three things. So on a related note, Dion, any predictions for two years out? And then if you can, oh. five years out. Let's oh start with goodness. two. All right. Um, the things that come to mind for me. So the first is proactive autonomous AI. And not to like make that buzzwordy, but what I mean by that is right now when it comes to customer experience and probably every AI interaction out there, it's all reactive. You ask GPT a question, GPT produces an answer. You ask a customer service inquiry, you have an AI agent or hopefully an agentic AI respond to it. What I think is going to happen more and more is AI that's going to be operating a little bit more in the background. You know, going through, oh, there's a bunch of support inquiries coming in about this particular issue or this particular um, product launch. There must be something wrong here. I'm going to notify the support leaders or I'm going to proactively suggest an article that might be up for approval. Like that just doesn't exist today. And I think over the next two, three years or so, that proactive AI agent is going to become more powerful. And then the second prediction I have, which is actually somewhat unrelated to customer experience, but in a sense it is actually core to all customer and human experiences is that we're going to start seeing more AI on the consumer side, right? Like today with a technology like Forethought, any business can use an agentic AI for their customer experience to interact with their customers. But as an end user, there's still not really a form of agentic AI you can use. The best you've got is a chat GPT, which you can talk to, ask questions with. Um, but imagine a world where you're going to have your own personal AI agent that's interacting or booking your haircuts or whatever it may be, um, uh, doing your groceries. So I think like this idea of agentic AI is going to actually bleed into every part of our um, kind of ecosystem. And it's actually going to be really powerful and enable a lot of um, potential for humans. Do you remember that LinkedIn video about the, the AI talking to each other? The yeah, AI yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> AI talking to AI. Any thoughts about that? Oh, my goodness. So I think it's going to happen, right? Like, I think that the ability to have AI talk to AI is going to be interesting. Um, there was this one video. I, I don't know if it's the one you're referencing, but then at some point they're like, oh, you're an AI. Let's yeah. talk in like uh, some like binary language or whatever. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen because um, I think language, human language, and the ability for us to express ourselves um, through language is actually a very powerful programming paradigm, even for AI. And I think what's what's uh, happening is kind of a tangent, but when you actually think about every breakthrough in AI, what's happened is each of these models have had to learn something core and critical about how the world works in order to be useful, right? Like language models, large language models like GPT, their core task was actually language prediction. Like, what is the next word that somebody is going to use? And it turns out, in order to even be able to predict that at a massive scale, you need to encode a whole lot of human logic, deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning. And it turns out, almost by accident, that that made it extremely powerful. And I think like in the future, there are going to be other kinds of models that can encode things about humans. Like, for example, video generation models. So you've seen maybe Sora or other things like that. Well, in order to properly generate a video of a, of a cloth, you need to know almost the laws of physics. How is it going to fall? How, does these how do these things interact? So these models really have to get good at learning what's, what makes humans human and what makes the world go round in order to be useful to humans. So I don't think that's ever going to go away. Are you optimistic about a future of AI or are you a little scared? I'm pretty optimistic. But like, I mean, I'm, I'm paid to be. So. <laughs> <laughs> but but what, what I mean by that is I think these breakthroughs happen, and then at the same time, safeguards and the ability for the public to just understand it and, and find ways of using it in safe ways happens in tandem. Like, we're not seeing, it's not like GPT came out of nowhere. That was GPT-3 that broke the internet in some senses, right? At Forethought, we were actually leveraging GPT-1 back in 2019, right? And so you see these language models increasing, and then once, um, a model is able to do something useful to the world, you also see people coming in and asking, okay, what are the natural risks? How do we handle bias? How do we handle hallucination and things like that? And that research is kind of working in tandem. And so I think the, the potential for both good and bad with AI is there. I think in general though, 
um, humans, like we as a society, have been able to take these technologies and largely make them useful to us in, in a positive way. So that's what I'm, I'm actually most excited about and most optimistic about is that we as people are going to be able to harness the technology for good. Well, since we had the um, rapid fire, the businessy part, we're done with that now. Do you want to do some rapid fire fun questions? This has all been fun. Okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Are you ready for rapid fire? All right. I'll, I'll go quickly. Is what is what I'm hearing. Okay. Good. All right. Dion, best meal. Ooh, sushi. Idea of perfect happiness. Um, warmth, water around me or greenery, so either blue or green, um, good food, good people, and karaoke. I like that, okay. Um, favorite TV show you're watching right now? Severance, hands up, are you, please? Yes, Yes. in fact, coming to Utah at the airport, they were talking about filming it here. No. And I started geeking out, yeah. 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 So do you have a theory on what Cold Harbor is? No, I don't have a theory on Cold Harbor. Right. That's literally the only show we're obsessed with right now. <laughs> Favorite splurge? Oh. I don't think I have one. I'm like pretty miserly. Okay. Favorite yeah. city? I want to see New York. New York City. Okay. It's, just, it's so fun. If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, but there's a long story there. You probably already have had lunch with her exactly. on your advisory board. Literally, exactly. Did and she make you lunch? Did she do like the boyfriend breakfast like she does on Instagram? Um, we had we had we had dinner. My wife and I had dinner with her and her husband once, and she's just like one of the loveliest humans on the planet. So like, if I could ever like any time I have an opportunity to 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 grab a meal with her is like that's, awesome. that's that's on my list. All right, and your life motto in a few quick words. It, it used to be that it all works out was my was my life motto. I think it's like a it's like a statement of optimism that like no matter what's what's happening, the windy ups and downs of the journey, like if you if you know where you're going, you will you will eventually get there. Yeah, I think I haven't thought about that in a while, but that's probably just stuck with me since I was like 14. Actually, their studies show if you say everything's going to be OK, it does something to your brain that for some reason like relaxes you. So I actually, I love that. And I say it all the time to my family. I'm like, everything's gonna <laughs> Everything be okay. okay. <laughs> it's all good. Everything's exactly. gonna be good. Um, if people wanna learn more about you and Forethought, where can they do that? Yes, um, uh, request a demo, learn about Forethought at forethought.ai. Um, and you can also find me on any of the social channels, LinkedIn, um, X, if they're still calling it that, Threads, uh, all, all of the above at um, I'm just Dion Nicholas or Doji Dion. This was so fun. Thank you for doing the modern customer, doing the rapid fire round with AI. Semi-rapid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hong Kong did rapid, but I, yeah. I'll try next time. Yeah, and hopefully you'll come back on the modern customer for a third time. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Blake. This yeah. is so much fun, as always. All right, and everybody, you've been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. Until next time. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to like or subscribe and follow my social content on other platforms where I post content daily, including X, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, and more.